One by one, Europe's iconic buildings fade to black. First, the London Eye, then the Eiffel Tower, quickly followed by the Colosseum and the Brandenburg Gate. Across every major city, the twin sounds of screeching tires and crashing metal ring out as traffic lights fail. Doctors and nurses scramble to save their patients as life support machines stop working. This is merely the beginning of the drama. Credit cards and cash machines become useless. With no internet or mobile phone signal, misinformation spreads like a virus. Scared, people start stockpiling food and essential supplies. Riots and looting break out as the panic reaches fever pitch. Just what could cause such bedlam? The answer is the sun, when it unleashes a mighty solar storm. Astronomers estimate that the Earth is hit by a storm of this magnitude every 150 years. The last one, 1859. You're watching V101 Space. My name's Rob, and if you enjoy diving into the wonders of space, don't forget to subscribe for much more to come. The birds begin their cheerful morning chirps as the gold miners of the Rocky Mountains yawn, stretch and start preparing their breakfasts. Yet both have been fooled. The sun still sleeps far below the horizon. The apparent light in the sky is not daylight, but the vivid brushstrokes of intense aurorae. There is so much energy coursing through the atmosphere that the oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the air are on tenterhooks, buzzing with enough energy to make them glow. These events unfolded on the first week of September 1859. The drama began on the first, while the English astronomer Richard Carrington was busy sketching the dark blemishes on the solar surface, known as sunspots. Suddenly, the serene scene changed. Carrington was blinded by an intense flash of light. Less than a day later, aurorae filled the skies, not just in their usual locales of the Arctic and Antarctic, but as far south as the Caribbean and the Sahara Desert. What Carrington saw was a solar flare, an intense brightening of a small part of the sun's atmosphere. What he didn't see was the accompanying explosion of material spat out into space, an event known as a coronal mass ejection, or CME. The CME of 1859 has become known as the Carrington Event, the most powerful solar storm on record. A single CME contains around a billion tons of solar material. That's the equivalent of the mass of Mount Everest. What's more, this mountain's worth of material is rocketed outwards at a million miles per hour. A single CME can release as much energy as half a trillion atomic bombs. The fuse for these celestial cannonballs is magnetism. The sun is so extraordinarily hot that ordinary atoms get ripped apart. The negatively charged electrons that usually orbit around the outskirts of atoms are prized away, leaving behind positively charged atomic nuclei. This electrically charged subatomic soup is known as plasma. Whenever electrically charged particles move, they generate magnetic fields. It is the sun's magnetic mood swings that are responsible for solar storms. Think of the sun's magnetic fields as a series of elastic bands. Twist elastic bands and they become a store of energy. Twist them too much and they snap, flying across the room as the stored energy is explosively released. When the sun's magnetic fields snap, huge bursts of energy and material are spat out into space. They emanate from the sun's outer atmosphere, a layer called the corona, which is why these events are known as coronal mass ejections. 
At the peak of its powers, the sun can belch out up to three CMEs a day, flooding the solar system with charged particles. Yet, the debris almost always misses the Earth. After all, we are a tiny planet over a million times smaller than the Sun, sitting a colossal 150 million kilometers away. A direct hit is the equivalent of you throwing a bullseye on a dartboard from a distance of around 150 kilometers. Even if a CME does come barreling directly towards us, it's not always catastrophic. It depends on which way the CME's own magnetic field is pointing. Earth has a magnetic field too, one that is manufactured deep in the bowels of the planet as molten metal sloshes around in the core. Those magnetic field lines then surge out of Earth's poles and far into space, creating a protective cocoon around us. Crucially, Earth's magnetic field points from the South Pole to the North Pole. If a CME arrives from the Sun and its own magnetic field also points south to north, then there is little cause for alarm. Earth's magnetic field is able to adequately protect us. It is only when the CME's magnetic field points in the opposite direction to ours, that is from north to south, that we have a problem. Then, the magnetic field lines from the CME begin to join with those of Earth, linking up and peeling away our precious layers of protection. Charged particles from the Sun come rushing in, flooding Earth's magnetic field. Particles that were previously trapped in Earth's magnetic field are dislodged by the deluge, surging along magnetic field lines until they come crashing down onto the planet's poles. The energy they deliver is what lights up the skies with aurora. During the biggest storms, the aurorae are pushed considerably beyond the Arctic and Antarctic circles as the Earth is overwhelmed with charged particles. The Carrington event of 1859 may have been the biggest solar storm on record, but it actually did very little damage. That's only because the world was a very different place back in the 19th century. The light bulb and the telephone wouldn't be invented for almost another two decades. Today, the modern world hums with electrical infrastructure. Cables and wires stretch out from cities, towns and villages like veins and arteries. The world's biggest metropolises can be seen from space even at night. The glow of their streetlights is unmistakable. Yet, our power grids are only designed to deal with so much electrical current. If the charged particles from a solar storm add more, the system cannot handle it. The result is widespread power cuts. This happened to the Canadian city of Quebec back in 1989. A solar storm far less intense than the Carrington event arrived and deprived the city of electricity for nine hours. It cost over $13 million to fix, with about half of that money spent on replacing damaged equipment. It was a big warning sign, one which almost every government in the world has failed to adequately heed. According to one 2017 estimate, a Carrington-like event unfolding today would cost the USA alone $40 billion a day. It could well take months to fully restore our power grids, meaning the total cost could run into the trillions. And that's just for one country. It's not hard to see how social unrest could lead to rioting and looting as food, water and other essential supplies run low. Thinking of the sun in this way takes a bit of getting used to. After all, the sun is supposed to be the thing that supports life on Earth, not threaten it. In truth, our nearest star is a bit like Jekyll and Hyde. Equal parts benevolent and belligerent. The sun and its storms can even influence the course of wars. In the summer of 1972, the US had been deeply entrenched in the Vietnam War for almost two decades. President Richard Nixon was looking for an edge and decided to drop sea mines into the Gulf of Tonkin. 
The idea was that the mines could detonate when ships carrying Vietnamese supplies got close. The Sun had other plans. In August 1972, a massive CME hit Earth. All the extra electricity surging through the planet triggered the mines without any ships in sight. This all unfolded just four months before Apollo 17, the last mission to land astronauts on the moon. Had the CME hit astronauts on the lunar surface, all three would have been dead within a fortnight due to the extreme radiation exposure. Protecting astronauts from solar radiation remains one of the biggest challenges of space travel. There is no way to stop solar storms, but there is a way to guard against their worst effects. Forecast them. We can't eliminate hurricanes or tornadoes either, but meteorologists still save lives by accurately predicting and tracking them. So astronomers are working hard to develop highly detailed space weather forecasts. For one thing, the number of CMEs the sun spits out rises and falls in a repeating pattern known as the solar cycle. Solar activities peak at so-called solar maximums, which occur on average every 11 years. That's when the sun is coughing out three CMEs a day. By the time we see a stormy region brewing on our side of the sun, it's too late. During the Carrington event, the sun spat out a CME so quickly that it struck the Earth within 17 hours. A repeat today would leave us with very little time to take evasive action. That's why some astronomers have proposed sending a spacecraft, which they would aptly name Carrington, to a spot where it could see the side of the sun. It would study the part of the sun that is about to roll around to face us. That could give us five days of notice instead of less than 24 hours. Knowing which way the CME's magnetic field is pointing is also vital information. Right now, we don't know that until it hits the Advanced Composition Explorer, or ACE spacecraft, sitting between us and the Sun. Yet ACE is so close to the Earth that the CME arrives here under an hour after it hits the spacecraft. Sometimes it is as little as 15 minutes. What could we do with more notice? You might think it would be best to turn everything off, but counterintuitively, the opposite would be better. There are always parts of our power system down for repair or maintenance. Turning everything on at once would mean that the electrical currents raining down from space would be shared out across as many bits of equipment as possible. This reduces the risk of any one component becoming overwhelmed. As is often the case, knowledge is power. The more we study the sun and learn about its patterns, rhythms and behaviours, the more we can migrate the worst of its dangers. It's all part and parcel of living up close and personal with a mighty nuclear powerhouse. I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did then remember to like and subscribe for much more to come. And if you would like to support my channel even further then why not buy me a coffee? A small donation goes a long way and helps me improve what I am attempting to build. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.